SJC 1025 2, Commonwealth v. Moran. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Kokovka. Good morning, Your Honors. Varsha Kokovka for the Commonwealth. The indictment that charged assault with intent to murder should not have been dismissed. A specific intent to kill under the McCarthy probable cause to arrest standard is the issue here, and that's looked at in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth. Specific intent to kill is a thought process, the defendant's mental state. And here, the defendant pointed a loaded gun at the head of his girlfriend. I have one question that to me is very important, or could be very important. Aside from the statement that the defendant made, you know, I'll kill you if you don't leave the house or whatever he said like that, was there also another threat that he made to kill her? Was that put into the grand jury? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The sequence is short, but if I can just... Because the judge seemed to focus only on that. Right. If I can just lay out the sequence. The defendant was fighting with his girlfriend. She was in her full police uniform, and he threw her on the ground. He ripped away her cell phone from her. He got his own gun from upstairs, loaded gun, held it to his head, threatened to kill himself. Then he ripped away her police radio from her and threatened to kill both of them and said that her lieutenant would not be able to get in the house. Okay. So why isn't that enough to make out assault with intent to murder? You don't know. She says it is. Yeah, that's why. All of those circumstances. I mean, the pointing her... Then he wrestled her gun from her holster, the loaded gun, held it to her head, and threatened to kill her. So that alone, I'm saying, hit the mark of specific... Well, if she didn't leave, he would kill her, right? I mean... No, but first he had, according to the assistant district attorney, first it was just a threat, I'll kill you and myself. That did not have the gun to her head at that moment. But he did... Yes, he did threaten to kill both of them. With anything or just, I'll kill you and myself? Well, at that point, he had thrown his own gun onto the ground, and she said she was going to call her lieutenant. He threatened to kill me. He threatened to kill himself. He had emptied it first, hadn't he? He had emptied it and thrown it on the ground. Then he came after her to get... And fought with her to get her loaded gun out of her holster. Could I ask you this question? With respect to generally assault with intent to murder, do you think that the assault itself needs to be potentially able to kill? I mean, in other words, sometimes cases are where someone is actually shooting a gun, and it doesn't hit anybody, but it's shooting a gun and then is charged with that. But there have been shots fired. So my question is, does it matter what the assault is? Does that have to be on its way, just the assault itself being a potential for killing? It doesn't have to be an attempt. The assault can be either theory of an attempted battery or... But Justice Boxford's question, which I think helps at least explain what the judge did here, is to say you have to do something. So if you take the scenario that you gave, at the moment when with his revolver, and I'm looking now at what the district attorney, assistant district attorney told the court, he went upstairs. He said, I'm going to kill myself. She said, stop, stop, put the gun down. And so he was, as it were, didn't have the capacity, the potential ability to kill her at that point. Yes, I'd say that the statement... So the question is, do you need that? That's, I forget the case it was, which is when you were pointing a gun at, you know, the police are, the police are chasing somebody down the street. The person turns around and shoots, doesn't hit anybody, but you can have an attempt to commit murder because 
using that instrumentality in that way could result in death. That's right. It, it doesn't have to be effectuated in, in any sense um, further than the assault with the state of mind. Those are the two elements of this crime. And this court has said in the Johnson case where uh, this court decided that mental impairment would, would not be a mitigating factor uh, under this offense. Um, in that case, it wasn't a sufficiency of the evidence even at trial or grand jury, but there was a conviction for, for this crime where the defendant taped a knife to his hand and grabbed his wife's hair and put the knife to her throat and threatened to kill her. So, so it doesn't have to be a shooting or a, you know, a little bit of a stabbing. It just has to be an assault coupled with a specific intent. Can I ask you this question? I know this, this is obviously at the grand jury stage and we're talking about a very different standard to be applied and a very deferential one. In fact, ordinarily the court should not get engaged at all in assessing the sufficiency and only if there's no evidence should the court perhaps get in the middle of the grand jury decision making. But let's assume we're at trial. I mean, I love your citation to this 1821 case to support the proposition that a contingent intent is okay, can still be assault with intent to murder. But do you seriously, I mean, let me ask you, assume there's a trial, and this is the evidence. Would you be asking for an instruction that, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you find that he intended to kill her, if she did not leave, that would be sufficient? Well, the instruction as it is, um, <coughs> or, or could be uh, modified, is that an intent to scare or terrify would not be mm -hmm. enough, that there has to be an right. intent to kill. So if, if the jury were to find that, in fact, he intended to kill her if she did not leave the house, that would be sufficient in your view? That would be correct instruction here? The correct ins instruction would be, well, in addition to Commonwealth versus Martin and the cases that I cited at my brief on pages 19 to 20, I'd ask this court to look at Holloway versus United States, 526 U.S. 1. That case um, talks in depth. It, it's analyzing the carjacking statute and the conditional intent. And it talks about an intent to kill in the alternative is nevertheless an intent to kill. In other words, it, it confirms and then expands tremendously on Commonwealth versus Martin um, and, those, and those older cases. And, and so and your answer to that question is? The, the answer to that question is, as far as a jury instruction, would be that in a conditional intent is nevertheless a specific intent to kill. Um, I, I don't think that that has to be part of a jury instruction, but what I'm trying to point out to this court in Holloway versus United States talked about the tremendous body of case law and the scholarship and the model penal code that all support the core understanding that mens rea is for specific intent to kill is satisfied with the conditional statement of intent or s s conditional or contingent intent to kill. Ms. Kukov, can I, Ms. Can I just, just, did, just, did, just, is Holloway in your brief? No, it's not in her no, brief and I'm about to ask this. Ms. Kukovka, did you inform um, Mr. O'Malley that you were going to rely on Holloway before today? No, I did not. Why did you not do that? Um, I, I suppose um, maybe it was a mistake. Um, it I was a mistake. It, it is often the case that as you're preparing for oral argument, you might come across something that you haven't come across before. Whether or not you can rely on that is questionable, but certainly you have to give opposing counsel the opportunity to respond. In any event, in this case, obviously Mr. O'Bri Mr. O'Malley will be able to supply a response in a 16L letter, but I would ask you and your office, please, if you're going to rely on something that you haven't raised before, to please inform opposing counsel before you come here. We will do that, Your Honor. Um, the the Holloway versus United States, um, it does expand, as I said, on on the 
concept this that is not, in But this was not something, I mean, you know that Judge Sanders' ruling was looking, was resting precisely on the contingent nature of the, of the threat. And I did address that under Commonwealth versus Martin at the time that I wrote my brief. That was, that was the case that I, you know, it's Massachusetts <coughs> law talking directly about um, no, I'm not saying you're raising a new argument, but um, it, it's problematic for the trial judge, and it's certainly problematic for opposing counsel if they don't, you know, if you're suddenly coming up with references that they haven't had an opportunity to respond to. Right. When, when, um, do, you, when do you say the armed assault started? When he grabbed the gun from her or when he pointed the gun at her? Well, um, it, it, it's hard to kind of parse, we don't have, you know, how long this took, that there was um, any delay, that, that you know, he, he took the gun and stood apart from her, or, or you know, the way she describes it, and um, a victim in, in this kind of situation might not even remember exactly well, what I mean, but, but let's assume it plays out that all he did was grab the gun from her. Uh, would that be uh, an armed assault? Grabbing the gun from her, not necessarily, but yes. certainly pointing it at okay, her. Okay, so it's the so it's the pointing. So the so the, the crime began when he pointed the gun at her. Well, you could say uh, yes. You could say that 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 at that moment, what was his specific intent? And in the Gordon case um, at 41 Mass Appeals Court 459, where. Um, um, the defendant shot at one police officer and then the gun jammed or shot at one person. Um, the appeals court said that specific intent at the time the gun is pointed is, is the question. So okay. I would say here the same thing is true. Um, so, the, so the focus then of the fact finder should be at any point while that gun was pointed at her, did he have the intent to kill her? That's right. And again, it's, it's under the... Um, the grand jury um, sufficiency of the evidence standard. Do, do you think that the um, that one should look at all as to what happened immediately thereafter? That is, she says, um, "Drop the oh. gun," and and he does. No, because again, it's the specific intent at the time the gun is pointed at her. Um, you know, other circumstances can be considered in terms of his prior and subsequent violence against her in terms of what his specific intent well, might have been. Well, let me just ask you about that. I mean, it seems to me it's not really fair to look at, I, I can see the argument as to prior, but as to subsequent, you know, three weeks later, why is that relevant to what his intent was on October 18th? It's it really is not necessary to the analysis. Because um, you go through in your facts a lot about, you know, what happened in November. And it just right, but what it comes down to is the moment of the gun pointed at her head and some of the escalation that led up to it in terms of his specific intent. Um, you know, there are, there are cases that talk about prior and subsequent violence. So, so I did say that. We're certainly not relying on that um, in terms of the um, sufficiency of the evidence before the grand jury. Um, if there are any other questions from the panel, then I will rest on my brief and ask this court to vacate the dismissal of the indictment. Thank you, Ms. Kukovka. Mr. Shevely. Good morning. <clears throat> May it please the court, my name is John Chevry. I'm here on behalf of the law offices of Daniel O'Malley, representing the defendant, appellee, Sean Moran. <clears throat> is it your position that there is simply no evidence of intent to kill? No evidence of intent to kill before the grand jury? Your Honor, uh, as my sister just cited to, uh, when answering Justice uh, Gant's question, uh, the Gordon case uh, states that the specific intent should be measured uh, in this case and in that case uh, when the gun is pointed at the alleged victim. So I would state that 
that case indicates that pointing a gun at a victim alone isn't enough to infer the specific intent necessary. Along with the words that I'm, I'm going to kill you, prior words, I'm going to kill you and myself, and, and then the words, I'm going to kill you if you don't leave the house? The defendant appellee's position uh, in answer uh, to your question is that at the time in question when Mr. Moran was allegedly pointing the gun, the evidence, uh, there was no evidence of specific intent uh, for uh, Mr. Moran uh, to, for the grand jury to infer that at that time, Mr. Moran specifically intended to kill uh, the victim. Uh, again, to address uh, what Your Honor just stated about immediately prior to that, uh, Mr. Moran making a statement uh, alleging that he was going to kill uh, both himself and Ms. Chipman, uh, I, would, I would state that uh, that obviously is something to be potentially considered, but when you look, uh, and I'd suggest that if you look at the transcript of the proceedings uh, of the hearing before Judge Sanders, that both Attorney O'Malley on Mr. Moran's behalf and uh, ADA Capelli, who argued that motion for the Commonwealth, uh, did present uh, substantial portions, if not the entire uh, minutes of the grand jury for Judge Sanders to uh, consider, which I believe she indicated in the transcript that she was going to consider that. Uh, that being said, I would suggest that at the time that Mr. Moran pointed the gun at Ms. Chipman, the evidence is that Mr. Moran said uh, something to the effect of leave, one moment please, uh, leave or I will kill you. So I would suggest that the evidence at that moment uh, was that Mr. Moran stated, leave or I will kill you. My recollection of the grand jury minutes uh, leading up to that time, as Justice uh, Botsford uh, indicated when speaking with my sister, uh, that uh, mentioning the events that potentially happened in this relationship prior to this event before the court, uh, are certainly relevant uh, to the determination of uh, what Mr. Moran's intent was at the time. My, uh, I believe that the grand jury minutes show that prior to this event in October, that approximately a year and a half before, uh, Mr. Moran had an argument with Ms. Chipman where he allegedly pushed her uh, during the argument and she hit a garage door. And I think that prior to this, there may have been evidence presented to the grand jury that there was an argument where they were both, both Mr. Moran and Ms. Chipman were in a car. They pulled the car over during an argument and Mr. Moran threw the keys uh, into the woods. Uh, the, I believe that prior to that, to this incident that's before the court today, uh, there aren't, uh, there isn't any indication that was before the grand jury that uh, threats to kill ever were made. Uh, um, and I thought Miss um, Capelli at the hearing, maybe I'm mis misremembering it, said that he had said to acquaintances to, of his, and uh, maybe I, I've got the time wrong, I'm going to kill her one of these days, I'm going to kill her. That, uh, as the complainant said that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Answer I believe uh, my recollection, I, if that is a mischaracterization, I certainly apologize. No, no, no. But no, my, uh, you know if that, this record better than I do. <laughs> if that is the case, I would suggest that that falls under the type of statements that uh, my sister mentioned in the brief before the court, citing from 12 Angry Men, that that's the type of statement that uh, is made uh, in potentially contentious relationships. I'm going to kill her one of these days. I would suggest that that isn't the type of evidence that would allow, uh, that's sufficient for the grand jury to uh, draw a reasonable inference from the evidence before it that at the specific time Mr. Moran allegedly pointed the gun at Ms. Chipman that uh, he intended to uh, kill her. Uh, I would 
just state that uh, I'd request, obviously, that the court uh, not find I, as I'm a matter. I'm sorry, it was she. She. It was the. You're correct. I've just seen it on uh, record 54, 55. That it's she who's saying. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. And and Judge Sanders says, you know, fear is not sufficient. Her fear is not sufficient. Correct. So. And so I would. Your uh, memory is correct. I would state that a lot of the evidence. Uh, first of all, uh, I believe that the Commonwealth's position and concern, and one of the most prominent concerns, respectfully, uh, of the court uh, should be whether or not Judge Sanders did, uh, in fact, use the appropriate standard. And uh, I would suggest that uh, a view of her decision, and if one were to view uh, the transcript, uh, shows that Judge Sanders did, in fact, use the appropriate. When she says at the, you know, at the end of her decision, or near the end, no, ra but if no rational jury could find him guilty, then this is what we should do. But it, doesn't that sound mighty like the required finding standard? It sounds exactly like the required finding standard. And uh, I understand the courts and the Commonwealth's uh, potential concern with that statement. Uh, that being said, that's found uh, in the Commonwealth's brief, actually. That's found in the record appendix at page 67. Uh, I would state that that statement where uh, Judge Sanders, that paragraph, if I may read it, uh, Judge Sanders states, the Commonwealth argues that to dismiss the this charge at this point would be premature given the fairly minimal <coughs> amount of evidence required to support a grand jury indictment. Uh, I would suggest that Judge Sanders then states in response to the Commonwealth's position, uh, if no rational jury could convict the defendant of armed assault with intent to murder, however, then this court sees no reason to allow this charge to remain in the case. And I understand why that's concerning. However, I think what's important is right after that and right before Judge Sanders issues her decision, she states, uh, she states the McCarthy, Commonwealth v. McCarthy, McCarthy standard, standard. Yeah. saying, accepting Shipman's testimony is true in its entirety. It is not <coughs> enough to warn a prudent man in believing that the defendant had committed the offense of the armed assault with intent to murder. And I would point out that uh, in the uh, transcript of the grand jury minutes, uh, it shows that Judge Sanders uh, at one point states to Mr. O'Malley, who made that argument, uh, specifically points out that the decision that she has to make is under the McCarthy standard, the probable cause standard, and not the directed verdict standard uh, in the light most favorable to the Commonwealth. Uh, here's, here's, here's my, I guess, my main problem with this. We have the grand jury that's heard about a series of um, inter violent interactions, potentially violent interactions and violent interactions between these two people involving guns, involving threats to kill you, me, her. I mean, there's no question that there are crimes going on here. Should the court get involved before the evidence is presented to a jury in parsing out, well, is it sufficient to make out this crime versus that crime versus some other crime? Is that what we should be doing with grand jury testimony? Isn't that a little bit, I mean, there is a reasonable basis here for a prudent person to think that the defendant committed some violent crimes involving this person, involving guns, and involving threats. Isn't that enough? Uh, Your Honor, respectfully, I uh, would state that in this case, for the specific intent required for armed assault with intent to murder, the evidence presented to the grand jury wasn't enough. Uh, the Commonwealth's present position uh, in its memorandum is that uh, <coughs> if the person is there uh, and that there's evidence of criminality, that that is enough. Uh, and as I indicate in my memorandum, I would suggest that uh, the courts in practice have actually uh, looked at whether or not sufficient evidence has been presented uh, before the grand jury. Uh, in the Goldstein case, for example, that the Commonwealth cites, uh, the appeals court uh, and I cite it in my brief as well. The appeals court says that in that case they were looking at a uh, robbery, uh, a burglary, where uh, the lower court overturned or threw out the indictment. Uh, the appeals court reversed the lower court's decision, saying that it's a close call in this case, but, uh, and as I state in my memorandum, 
uh, the lower court's decision was based on a precise sequencing of events. And it wasn't the lower court's uh, position or uh, role to do that. Uh, I'd say that the case before the court today is distingu distinguishable in that if you look at Judge Sanders' decision is not based on a precise sequencing of events. It's looking at the events leading up to the event where Mr. Moran allegedly pointed the gun at Ms. Chipman and looking uh, at the statement, uh, leave or I will kill you. And uh, that no matter which way you sequence the events in the case before the court today, unlike Goldstein, I would suggest that uh, it isn't uh, it isn't it is distinguishable this can, case. Can, can I ask you this and maybe maybe it's in your brief and I just don't remember where uh, would you agree that um, if the jury if a jury found that the defendant intended to kill the complainant here with a gun while he had it pointed at her if in fact she did not leave her house would that be sufficient to support the crime of armed assault with intent to murder. I think that, uh, admittedly, I think that the case law specific to armed assault with intent to murder uh, is not 100% clear on that. The case, the case law. It's an 1821 case. Seems very close on. <laughs> that 1821 case, Your Honor, and I, I too was impressed at uh, a sighting of a case of that age. Uh, that case involves robbery, and mm -hmm. the court in that case uh, specifically states that uh, in robbery, when the determination is being made. Uh, of whether or not there was intent to kill or maim. Uh, that's in the context of robbery, and that is to determine whether or not it was a highly aggravated robbery. Uh, and I'd suggest that a contingency in a crime such as robbery is built in to the, uh, is built into the law. When someone goes in to rob someone uh, with a gun, the obvious goal of that action is to rob someone. In this case, that contingency isn't built in. The goal of armed assault with intent to murder is to murder someone. And I'd suggest that the line of cases cited by the Commonwealth, starting with the Martin case from 1821, uh, and uh, including the uh, there's a case that's cited by the Commonwealth uh, Commonwealth v. Slaney, in which it discusses uh, a civil case, Ross, and a criminal case, White. And in those cases, uh, I'd suggest that a lot of the uh, evidence and a lot of the case law cited by the Commonwealth uh, goes toward bank robberies, where I, again, would argue that uh, a contingency is kind of built in to the uh, law itself. Also, it talks about uh, joint venture, joint, joint venturers, bank robberies where there's a person sitting out in the getaway car and that person doesn't know whether or not the principal is actually going to kill someone but is there ready and waiting, willing and able to assist if that's necessary. So I'd suggest that that's different. Uh, so based on that, I'd respectfully request the court not to find that Judge Sanders erred as a matter of law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chevrolet.